Okay, hello and welcome to our solar program. My name is Joe Wheelock, and I come to you live from the McDonald Observatory in far west Texas. Today you will, learn, you will learn many fun things about our nearest star, the sun, and we will also be showing you some live solar reviews. Uh, we have a nice sunny day here at the observatory, so you should get some great views today of the sun. And we will also be talking about solar solstices later on during the program. Now, I live and work here at McDonald Observatory. I've been here for over 21 years. Before I came here, I did progress for, for an astronomy club and also worked at a planetarium. I have a degree in electronics, and I've also had courses in chemistry, physics, and mathematics. But my real passion has always been astronomy. Okay, I want to introduce my co-host, Saul Riviera. He'll be helping us out today. So, Saul. Yep. Hello, my name is Saul Rivera. I also live and work here at the McDonald Observatory, same as Joe, though for not nearly as long. I've only been here for a little under two years so far. And I also work at the Visitor Center, do kind of like the tours, educational programs, such, and we'll be co-hosting for today's solar viewing program. And with that, uh, we'll start getting our solar views ready in a bit. See, seeing people from all over right now, a lot of Texas people. Hello, y'all. Let's see. And Joe, whenever you're ready with your views, just feel free to jump right back in. Okay, thanks, Saul. All right, let's go ahead and get on uh, with our program today. Now, the McDonald Observatory, we are located in far west Texas, out here in the Davis Mountains region. You can see our location here on uh, this map. And here is a picture of some of the telescope domes on our campus. In the foreground, you can see two white domes. The dome on the left-hand side contains our 82-inch or 2.1-meter auto screw telescope, opened up in 1939. In fact, last month we celebrated the, the 82nd anniversary of the 82-inch telescope. Next here, you can see the dome of the 107-inch Harlan J. Smith telescope opened up in the late 1960s. In the background, you can see the silver dome of the Hobby Eberly telescope. That telescope has an equivalent aperture of 394 inches or about 10 meters. Now, I'm not located at the summit of the mountain. I'm actually located at the base of the mountain uh, near our visitor center and telescope park you can see here in uh, this flyover. And I'm sitting in the studio, studio area of our old visitor center. And the telescopes we'll be using today, they're located, they're in what is called a roll-off roof observatory. The roof just rolls back and allows us access to the sky. And here are the telescopes we'll be using to view the sun today. We have three telescopes. We have a six inch telescope and we have a, a couple of smaller telescopes. We have cameras and filters that allow us to view the sun safely. And the telescope is on a mountain that compensates for the Earth's rotation. It tracks an object across the sky, and the mounting is totally computer controlled. And some safe ways to view the sun. One safe method is to use a filter that fits on the very end of a telescope. We have different types of filters, glass filters, and luminized mylar filters. Now the safest way to view the sun is to project the image on a piece of white paper or a piece of white cardboard. And some quick facts about the sun. The sun is made up mostly of hydrogen, also helium, and trace amounts of other elements. It has a diameter of 865,000 miles, or about 1.4 million kilometers. It's about 93 million miles away from the Earth, or about 150 million kilometers. Temperature of the sun is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 5,500 degrees Celsius, 
estimated age of the sun is about four and a half billion years old. Okay, so those are some quick facts today about our nearest star, the sun. Okay, let's get on uh, with some live views today of the sun. And give me a second here, and I will fire those up for you. Our live views today of the sun. Okay, so here we have a live view of the sun. Let me add my face for a minute. Well, here we have a live view today of the sun. Now, to, pro to prove this is not a picture, I will move the telescope. Not moving the sun. Moving the telescope here. Now, the bottom set of controls, you might notice, those are for our cameras, and I'll be making heavy use of those later on during the program. Now, earlier I mentioned, a few minutes ago, I mentioned the size of the sun, 865,000 miles across. Now, you could fit 100 mile Earths across the disk of the sun. I have a question for you. How many Earths do you think might fit inside of the sun? the sun's volume. If you think you know the answer to that question, post it in the chat, and we'll answer the question later on during the program. Now you can see that we have a sunspot today, my sunspot. Sunspots, they appear dark because they're cooler than the rest of the sun. And I use cool as a relative term. The temperature of sunspots average about 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit or about 3,400 degrees Celsius. Now, right now, there is not a lot of activity happening on the sun. That's because we are coming out of a deep solar minimum. Once every 11 years, the sun will reach a peak of activity where we have a lot of things happening. It hovers there for a couple of years, then it will go back down. Now, our next solar maximum will be in about four years or so. And another thing you might notice on our view of the sun today is it has kind of a, a grainy appearance to it, like a peel on an orange. That is called granulation. In fact, I want to share with you a video of these what we call these granules close up. So let me get, let's say goodbye for a minute to our live view of the sun. And I will find this video in my slideshow here. So let's find that video. Here we go. Okay. Yep. Let's share my screen here. All right. While Joe's setting that up, there has been some. Quite some guesses come in about how big the sun is. So how many Earths can fit in the sun bear yet? So over a thousand, 10 million, a million, million plus. We'll have to see in a bit how much that actually is. Okay. Okay, this was taken back in December of 2019 by a four meter telescope located in Hawaii. It is the world's largest solar telescope. In this picture, we'll get a better idea about the size of the individual granules. They're about the size of Texas. And here is a closer view of these granules. You can think of it behaving kind of like a pot of boiling uh, water. And then finally, an amazing close-up view of these convective uh, cells coming up here. So yeah, I find this a really amazing um, image here of the sun. Okay, next we're going to view the sun in what we call hydrogen alpha light. And so I was going to tell you all about hydrogen alpha light while I set up for that part of the program. So take it away for a few minutes here, Saul. All right. Yeah, so Joe's going to switch over to hydrogen alpha. You might be wondering, well, what does that mean? So hydrogen alpha, 
is, well, for sure, can be shortened to H alpha. And what occurs is in our hydrogen atom, when it receives or releases energy, the electron can actually jump between different energy levels. That's Kevin's little chart here. This little jump between energy levels can only occur at certain specific wavelengths, though. It's kind of like trying to tune into a radio station. Only certain of them work. When this occurs, we get a really cool pattern. We can actually measure this and get a really cool pattern we call a spectrum. So here we have a picture of hydrogen spectrum. So you can see that on the very top, we have what we call a continuous spectrum, or a nice rainbow bar. And the numbers underneath each and underneath them are the wavelengths and nanometers. Now, and scientists sometimes like to give names to the lines that we see here. So these that you see is hydrogen spectrum, its signature. Every single element in ion has its own unique signature, its own unique pattern. So since each one's its own unique pattern, we know this is hydrogen. That's how we know it's hydrogen. No other element or ion has the same wavelength pattern. Scientists like to call the these areas of emission for this spectrum or absorption for this one after some of the Greek alphabets. So alpha, beta, gamma, etc. Since this is our alpha line in hydrogen, we will call it our hydrogen alpha line or H alpha for short. When we are actually observing through the wavelength of the H alpha, we can get some really cool views, see some pretty cool stuff. And Joe's going to show you a bit of those views. You ready, Joe? See, so seems so All right, good. yes, I'm ready, Saul. All right, thanks a lot for the information. All right, so let's go ahead and go to hydrogen alpha light. Okay, so this is a view of the sun again in hydrogen alpha light, as Saul described to you, to, to you here. Now, uh, the sun, let me put my face up for just a minute here. Now, the sun, it of course rotates on its axis. Different parts of the sun rotate at different speeds. The equator, rotates faster than the poles. Now it takes the sun about a month or so to rotate on its axis. And the sun has a powerful mag magnetic field. So as it rotates on its axis, these magnetic field lines, they get twisted up kind of like a rope. And the areas where they twist up is where we have activity that happens on the sun. And you can see some more activity on the sun today besides the sunspot in hydrogen alpha light. That bright patch you can see, that is a hotter area on the sun called plage. Plage comes from a French word meaning beach. When people first looked at the sun, they thought there were oceans and beaches and mountains on the sun. There aren't, of course. These are just old names that have stuck with us throughout the ages. Now activity on the sun, it can affect us on uh, the Earth. We periodically have large eruptions on the sun called coronal mass ejections, or CMEs for short. When these eruptions impact the Earth's atmosphere, they can disrupt satellites, knock out cell phones. They can also cause displays of the aurora, the northern or the southern lights. Now, I grew up in southern Indiana, and I saw the aurora quite a bit from Indiana, only seen them a handful of times here though from uh, Texas. Okay, let's, let's take a look at the sun next with our main telescope, also in hydrogen alpha light. I think I just saw a bird fly in front of the sun there with our telescope. So yeah, bird flying from the telescope. Anyway, so we'll take a look at the sun with our main telescope here. And let me bring my face for a minute. and switch to the main telescope and you'll see what goes on behind the curtain while I do this. Give me a second here. Put 
Oh, I'll explain that. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, there isn't lava erupting from the sun. Nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, what you what you saw uh, that was a feature of the software that allows us to adjust the camera settings to the proper saturation, brightness, and contrast settings. So, okay, so let's move the telescope and find that sunspot grouping. Let's slow the telescope down. Hold on. There we go. Moving too fast. Find our friendly sunspot today. Here it is. Take a look at that. Nice sunspot there. Center it up a bit. Oops, wrong way. Okay. So you notice the, the sunspot has a darker center that is called the umbra and a lighter outer area, the penumbra. These are Latin words meaning shadow. When people first looked at the sun, they thought they were shadows on the sun. These names, umbra and penumbra, are old names that have stuck with us throughout the ages, also used in describing shadows during solar and lunar eclipses. In fact, we had a nice lunar eclipse visible last uh, last month, and I got out to see it myself. It was an early morning eclipse. Didn't get any pictures of it, but I did get out and take a, took a look at that eclipse. If you missed it, there's another lunar eclipse happening on November the 19th. Okay, let's move the telescope to a different area of the sun that we call the limb, not the edge, the limb, spelled like a tree limb. And I'll move the telescope here. And what I want to do to improve our view of this is paint the sun red with our software. There we go. Okay, you'll notice in our view of the sun here, there is kind of a fuzzy area. That is called the spicule layer. These are towering jets of gas, about half or so the size of the Earth. Okay, let's move the telescope. We'll travel around the sun today and try to find some activity. More activity. Let's see here. I'll probably have to do some camera adjustments. Ah, I see something. Let's adjust the camera. There we go. Take a look at that. I have a peek at that. Center this up. Okay, what we have here, everyone, put my face back up. Oops, go this way. What we have here is a feature known as a solar prominence, solar prominence. When you see a solar prominence, it has this kind of looping effect because it's following the sun's magnetic field, magnetic lines of force. Now, this prominence here we can see today it extends about 15,000, maybe 20,000 miles away from the limb of the sun. In fact, that brings you to the answer to the question I asked earlier, how many Earths would fit inside of the sun, the volume of the sun? The answer is 1.3 million. 1.3 million Earths would fit inside of the sun. If you got that answer right, give yourself a gold star. Okay, let's uh, remove my face and our faces and continue traveling around the sun today to find some more activity. See what's happening here. Yeah, very nice sunny day. Here's another prominence 
a little one? I'll say a little, if you can still fit the earth inside of that with room to spare. And there should be a bigger one. Now, here's a bigger one. Good. Let me adjust the camera. Yeah, very nice one there. Ha, that's a nice one. So again, think of the scale of that. You can fit the earth inside of that with lots and lots of room to spare. That extends maybe 30,000 miles away from the limb of the sun. Very nice one there. Okay, we'll continue traveling around the sun today. Nothing over here. Oops. Got some wind today, buffeting the telescope. A little breezy. At least it's clear and not raining. <laughs> That's a nice gust of wind there. Let's tow our camera down a bit. There's a little bitty one there. Let's tow the camera down more on this one. There. That's a little better. I know there's another one up here, too, that I want to get to. Somewhere up here. I thought it was, it was there earlier when I was checking things out. Oh, there, I passed it. Here it is. There we go. Oops, I don't know what that was. Okay. Another prominence there. Not as big as the ones that we saw, the other ones that we saw a couple of minutes ago. Now, the, the wind, I mentioned, I mentioned a minute ago that we have some wind kind of shaking the telescope today. Even on a calm day, uh, there is a bit of motion. That's because of distorting effects in the Earth's atmosphere. Standing on the Earth, looking at the sun, or anything else in the sky, if silver is standing in a parking lot on a hot summer day, and you see the, uh, the heat waves rising up, uh, this is why telescopes, like the Hubble telescope, are so great, is because we are away from distorting effects of the atmosphere of the Earth. Now, I'm sure you've heard the poem, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Our technical term for twinkling is called scintillation. So I guess if you want to be more accurate, you could say scintillate, scintillate, ball of gas. A less, little less poetic, more accurate than twinkle, twinkle, little star. Okay, so I will have some more things to share with you while I set up for our next part of the program, which will be about the solstice. So take it away for a few, few minutes here, Saul. All right, thank you, Joe. Got some really cool views of the sun today. So what I'm going to talk about next is a bit about well, where we work, the Visitor Center. So the Visitor Center here at the McDonald Observatory is currently open to the public, but reservations are required if you want to visit. Some of the things we are currently offering are guided tours. So we take you along the summits of the mountains, talk about the history of the observatory, the research going on here, and can take you into the gallery of the Hobby Everly Telescope the largest telescope on site and one of the largest telescopes in the world at 10 meters in diameter, so about 30 feet across. And in the gallery, you, there's a window that lets you look onto the dome floor, so you can see them working on the telescope, switching out mirrors and updating instruments, really cool. The other thing we're offering is the evening sky viewing program. So more originally more known as our constellation tour. We point out different constellations, how to find them, the stories behind them, and give you an overall tour of the night sky. Another program we're offering is our Star Party program. Now, traditionally, pre-COVID times, the program will involve looking through different telescopes, well, going being in lines, going up to different telescopes, looking through them and getting different views. Right now, what we're doing for the time being is we're still giving views through telescopes, but they're being projected onto a screen in our patio area. 
So there's a camera attached to the telescope, scanning some of those live views, then projecting them onto that screen. And you can get some really nice details with this due to long exposure times. If you don't want to do any of the programs, just want to drive on up and visit the visitor center, the gift shop, or the exhibit hall, we also offer general admission. That reservations are required for that as well. Let's see, also, let me answer some questions that might have come in. Ah, here's one from Linda M. Of what causes solar prominences? So, good question. So, the thing that causes solar prominences is actually the sun's magnetic field. Material can latch onto the field and begin to loop around with it, giving you that nice big looping motion. And the sun's magnetic field is a bit more chaotic than Earth's. It does go from north to south, but due to the sun's rotation, when gases rotate different parts move at different speeds, it kind of ends up, you can say, it can, ends up twirling around the magnetic field, almost making it all wild, like a ball of yarn the cat got to. And since it's kind of all over the place, when the prominences follow them, they kind of appear in different areas of the sun. See, it seems Joe's ready for the next part. Are you ready, Joe? Yes, I will. Uh, can I steal your cat analogy? Oh, sure. <laughs> I like that. I, I that's a good one. I haven't heard it, heard that before, so I will. Uh, I may use that during another in a future uh, program. Okay, yeah. So as I will mention, we're currently offering various programs here. We hope to see you all out here in the future as we begin to offer uh, more programs. So okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the solstice here. Find my slides. Okay, so what is a solstice? Uh, during a solstice, the Earth's axis is pointed most directly towards or away from the sun. The summer solstice for the Northern Hemisphere occurs around June 21st every year. It is on this day that the position of the sun in the sky at local noon is at its highest altitude of the year, and the position of the sun at sunrise and sunset is farthest north for the year. The winter solstice is around December 21st, marking the date on which the sun is lowest in the sky at local noon and rises and sets farthest south. Let's take a look at some simulations of these. Here we see the sun's position around sunrise, local noon, and its sunset on this year's summer solstice, June the 20th. Go out and take a look at this in a few days, but of course, don't look directly at the sun. Six months from now, grab your winter gear and take a look at the sun's position in the sky on December 21st around the same time and you will see a big change. Now many cultures around the world have constructed monuments to mark solstices. One of the most famous is called Stonehenge, located in the United Kingdom. If you've ever if you have ever been there, uh, share that with us in the chat. I'd love to go there myself someday and see that. And here is a picture of the sun rising at Stonehenge on the summer solstice. I think I'd love to witness that myself, and I'm sure that was an amazing event to to witness. And on a lighter note, there is a replica of Stonehenge located in Nebraska made of old cars. You may have heard of it or already guessed its name. It is called Car Hinge. But seriously, a number of indigenous cultures around the world did mark solstices and other astronomical events in various ways. One of them is called Serpent Mound, located in Southern Ohio. It was constructed by the Adena culture about one to 2,000 years ago. Below the picture is a diagram that shows how it marks sunrise and sunset positions at various times of the year. Another interesting construction is located in Chaco Canyon, Colorado, made by the Anasazi 
about 1,000 years ago. There are three large stone slabs leaning against a cliff that are aligned in such a way that on the day of the summer solstice, light from the rising sun passes through them and produces a dagger of sunlight that pierces the center of a spiral petroglyph carved in a rock. And here is a picture of our outdoor amphitheater where we conduct constellation tours during our evening programs. Our visitor center is constructed with spirals and circles that refer to ancient ruins found in the American Southwest. And not just in the Western wall of the amphitheater marks the approximate position of the setting sun on the dates of the summer and winter solstice, along with the spring and fall equinoxes. Now, knowing dates and solstices helps us mark the changes of seasons, and this is very important for farmers in planting and knowing when to harvest uh, their crops. So some inter interesting things about solstices. Okay, let's see here if we have any Questions, Saul. Let's get rid of the slides here for a minute. All yeah. Right. So, so question that came in is, what actually is a solstice? What does solstice mean? So, I think would you want to answer that one, Joe? Uh, sure. Yeah. De definitely. Definitely, uh, Saul. Yeah. So, yeah. Again, the solstices. Those are events that occur. Whenever the whenever the uh, the Earth is pointed most directly or away from uh, the sun in the sun in the northern hemisphere, the summer solstice is again around June 21st, and the winter solstice is on December 21st. Now, if you live in the southern hemisphere, the situation would be reversed. You would have you would have the winter solstice on, around June 21st and the summer solstice around December 21st. Uh, and here I see a question coming in here. Let's see, yeah, feel free to drop your questions. Yeah, and the solstices also mark the longest days of the year, right? Yes, uh-huh. And it comes from the root word of meaning, you know, soul or still. It appears to stand still. Misunderstood the question there, so. Let's see, I here's one question. from... Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. No, go ahead. Say one from Dan Presser. Is there any difference between a summer solstice each year? Has the sun moved? Any difference in between the summer solstice, the, the solstices each year? There's a slight difference in the um, in the dates. That's because of the centricities and the orbits of the Earth, and also the tilt of the Earth's axis. So there, there can be varying there varied differences in the dates of when they actually occur. But they're usually around around June 21st or so. All right. Oh, here's one from Linda M. Will the McDonald Observatory be observing the summer solstice in your amphitheater this year? Mm, not. It's not really something we do an event for, for the solstice. It's just kind of a cool thing. There actually is a way you can kind of observe it at home or do some activities, which kind of Joe will get into a bit later. But we don't really do any special events here at the observatory for the summer solstice. Oh, here's another one. John, and sorry if I say it wrong, Zarnik, what causes the sun to have a magnetic field? Do you want to answer that one, Joe? Do you want to take it? I don't care. Oh, okay. Uh, See, so your turn. I already answered the last one. Okay. All right. Yeah, th because the sun, um, it is not a... Uh, a solid object. It's not a solid um, object here. And so, with, so when it, it rotates on its axis, so those magnetic field lines, you know, they twist up 
as it rotates on its uh, its axis. It's a it's kind of like a you can think of it kind of like a like a dynamo effect, kind of like a dynamo effect here for the sun's magnet causing the sun's magnetic field. All right, thank you, Joe. questions? I don't really see any more questions right now coming nope. in. No questions. All right. I see somebody wrote here, Stonehenge is, a, is in Ingram, Texas, in the hill country. There is one there. Ooh. I, I, was not aware, I was not aware of that one. Not aware of that one, so. Okay, before we sign off today, I do have a few things to share with you, more things about solstices today. Let me bring up my slides here. What I want to share with you are some uh, fun solstice experiments you can do on your own. One thing you can do is record the location of the rising or setting sun throughout the year at the same time with respect to a tree, a house, or other permanent uh, fixture. And here is a picture that I took of the setting sun back on March, back about a week after uh, the solstice, or the, I'm sorry, the spring equinox uh, back on March, back in late March from our outdoor amphitheater. Now, if you want to dive deeper in, into this, you can set up a camera at a permanent location and take a picture of the sun's position in the sky at the same time of day throughout the year. If you are successful, you will get a picture that shows the figure eight pattern of the sun in the sky called the analemma. This pattern results from the change in the sun's declination due to the tilt of the Earth's axis of rotation combined by effects of the centricities and the orbits of the Earth. So those are some fun experiences you can do regarding the solstices on your own. Okay, so that will wrap up our program for the day. So thank you, Saul, for your help today. And also thank you to the moderator, thanks to the moderators in the chat for answering all of your all of your great questions today. We hope to see you all out here at some point in, in, in the near uh, future. We also offer our deep sky programs and lunar programs. You can check those dates out on our website and our various social media uh, platforms. Also, a shout out to our, the rest of our visitor center and staff in Austin for making them uh, possible. So, Saul and I would like to wish you a good day and a clear skies. And again, we hope to see you out here in. Uh, thank you very much for joining the program today. Thank you.